there's no question that the global community must listen to the voices of those who are experiencing the impacts of climate change first. Simultaneously, we have to gain a deeper understanding of the ocean beneath our waves through scientific exploration as well. During our first panel discussion, which I'm very excited about, we'll dive into how ocean rights are represented through the lens of exploration and climate change. Our three speakers include former ambassador for climate change and small island developing states issues for Seychelles, Ambassador Ronnie Jumeau, Sophie Morgan, who is a senior policy analyst for water and climate change with the government of the Seychelles, and also happens to be a strong youth advocate for climate change. And finally, our third speaker, Oliver Steeds, is a submersible pilot and chief executive and mission director of Necton. Let's welcome our panel to the stage. So let's jump right in. Ambassador yeah, sure. Jumeau, I would love to begin with you. Do you think that island nations are leading the charge when it comes to climate action and an example of what other nations can do? Well, well definitely the islands, starting with the Maldives, were the first to sound the clarion call about the dangers of what was going to happen. If you save the islands, you save everybody. It's as simple and as complicated as that. If the islands go, we're not going to go alone. Every port city in the world, New York, Miami, you name it, because of history, because the history of world trade, all the major centers of commerce and, and population are on coasts, on riverbanks. You all will follow us. It's important that small island developing states are not defined by the small. I don't like calling us large ocean states because large ocean states is L-O-S, loss, you're writing us off again. We're big ocean states, we're bosses. So we got to speak like a boss. And one thing I like to tell people when I'm traveling around the world, and something here you can try tomorrow when you go to a beach or to a shoreline. Go to the water's edge. Turn your back on the ocean. Look at your island. What you see is limitations. And you say, is that all we have? Turn your back on your island. Look out over the ocean. And the phrase changes from, is that all we have? It's, we have all that. That's the attitude we should have. And the issue of ocean rights, we need all the help we can get. Yes, we are custodians, uh, as, as bo big ocean, as bosses, we are custodians of huge waves of ocean. But the reality is, we are big ocean states limited by the resources of small island developing states, all in one. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah, I love that. Bosses, big ocean states, that's the way it should be uh, interpreted for sure. Now, I think I'll touch on that in just a few moments, but I want to move on to Sophie. You have quite a bit of experience leading and organizing several climate change and ocean-related uh, initiatives here in the Seychelles. So can you share your perspective about the impact of those campaigns in this island community? Well, um, you know, I think what Seychelles really wants to build on here is resilience. Right, so we do a lot of education outreach programs and try to get people involved, try to give them ownership so that they, they know what is at stake. I mean, the youth are very important. I mean, they, the next generation. But we also want to get the elderly people involved, like, because they are the ones who have been through everything. They know what was there before. We try to reach everybody, even if it's not government, if it's private sector, if it's NGOs, we try to get everybody on board so that they have a say. Because once people start to have a say, right, it means that they start to care about, care about it. And then that creates the ownership. And I think that's what's causing the, the impact. I think our programs are having a big impact, especially because we're having the Ocean Summit. I mean, <laughs> this is a huge impact. <laughs> but like also on the community level, people gather together on the weekends, their volunteer time. They just go out and the children talk to their parents and the parents talk to their parents. And you know, it's just a cycle. So here, this is what we try to do to build our resilience and create more impact. 
Ambassador Jamal, you previously said or have mentioned in the past that you know islanders generally see themselves as children of the ocean. Can you expand on this way of thinking and, and what that means when it comes to ha the ocean having its rights? The ocean is about who we are. It surrounds us. It's the first playground of our children. And it's a playground forever. But it is not about an island issue. For those of you who have been involved in international negotiations where there's climate change, SDGs or, or biodiversity, you know that when you identify yourself as an island group, you're immediately seen as a political grouping to look after your rights. You have to come and get, lend us a hand. It's something for everybody. So yes, we are the children of the ocean. We are of the ocean, we are in the ocean, we are all by the ocean, we are on the ocean. But once again, it is not an island struggle. We should be the bosses of that struggle. We should be leading, helping lead the struggle. But it is something for every human being. As her deepness, uh, uh, Sylvia Earle said, no blue, no green, no water, no life. Uh, moving on to Oliver, so thank you for being here. Your team's research with Necton mission here in the Seychelles has helped inform Se the Seychelles Marine Spatial Plan, which is very important. Share a little bit about Necton's mission and what do you feel are some of the most interesting finds and aspects of your research and exploration? Uh, thank you. Well, our, our mission here in Seychelles was with the government here uh, to help inform the designation of those marine protected areas. One of the challenges was there's very little data beneath 30 meters. Um, and this, as we've heard, is a big ocean nation. Days and days it takes to get out to the outer islands. And you know, the, the great abundance around Aldabra, the UNESCO Marine World Heritage Site, the Galapagos of the Indian Ocean. We know what's on, on the surface and on those islands. There's 100,000 giant tortoises roaming that island. But what lies beneath? And what we discovered is that you know, the tops of those atolls are really just the tops of the mountains. And beneath them, it just goes down. And, Every layer on the way down, you find different animals living in different depths. At the beginning, you've got the shallow depths, of course, the coral, everyone's quite aware of that. But as you go down into the mesophotic depths, down to sort of 100 meters or so, you find different animals that live down there, different corals, different sponges, different fish. You go deeper into the rarephotic zone from 130 down to 300 meters, you get new animals that live there. And we found it was the first evidence uh, of this new zone, uh, the, the rarephotic zone, uh, this new ecosystem that we found down there. Um, which was incredible. One of the things that struck me was the fragility, because down at about 110 meters was where we found the old beach line. So if we look over here where we are on, the, on Mahe, the deepest part on the Mahe plateau is about 70 meters. So only a few thousand years ago, it, it, what we've seen would have been a very different place. What, we would have, what the outer islands would have looked like would have been very different. Now we just see the peaks of these uh, undersea mountains, uh, these sea mounts, uh, which now sort of come across. So it was an extraordinary privilege to be able to document and witness it and share that story with Seychelles and the world. Let's take a moment to watch a quick video featuring Christina Gerd, Senior High Seas Advisor to the IUCN's Global Marine and Polar Program, and she's also a part of the Schmidt Ocean Institute Advisory Board. Um, and also Dr. Harriet Hardin Davies, who's a research fellow uh, with the NERIUS program at the University of Wollongong, Australia. Both of these brilliant women leaders will share their perspective about ocean rights and deep sea exploration. Exploring the ocean and understanding what lives there and how it's responding to human activities is critically important at setting agendas for international ocean policy. The exploration work that the Schmidt Ocean Institute does is to foster international collaboration to answer some of the key questions we have today facing ocean management and governance. Who lives there? What lives there? How do they thrive? What makes them tick? And how are they interconnected? Very few nations have the capacity to undertake the type of research needed to see in the deep sea, to do the marine science that involves deep ocean exploration. That means that there are many communities around the world that require assistance to be able to know what lives in the deep ocean, to monitor how it's responding to human activities, and to identify and put in place the types of policy measures that can help to conserve and sustainably use ocean life in the long term. 
I'm involved in the negotiations at the United Nations for this new international legally binding agreement called the BB&J Agreement for Marine Biodiversity Beyond Areas of National Jurisdiction. And this is where we're talking about enabling states to work together to establish marine protected areas, to conduct environmental impact assessments, to build capacity and better utilize marine genetic resources and share the benefits of it. Historically, the relationship between states and the international area of the ocean, these, these high seas, has been more on the right to use and less on the responsibility to conserve for future generations and to share equitably with present generations. That's really where the opportunity for this new UN treaty lies. Firstly, the way in which rights of nature laws and rights of nature perspectives make space for different ways of knowing and connecting to ecosystems is a really important basis to make ocean law develop in a way which makes room for more voices at the table. A second really important aspect of ocean rights is more focusing on the reciprocal relationship between people and the ocean. Taking the focus away from the right to use and putting more focus on that responsibility to conserve and thirdly, and crucial to all of this ocean governance here, is having the capacity, not just to conserve the ocean, but to be custodians of the ocean and ocean life. We have a reciprocal obligation to maintain the ability of nature to thrive and to evolve. They have a saying, in dubio pro natura, it means in doubt, opt to benefit nature. I think we need to really think about what the full life cycle implications of any of our ideas are. And by bringing in the rights of nature, it instills a new sense of respect, as well as limits, as well as that sense of responsibility and custodianship. Different people have different relationships with the ocean. For some, the ocean is a source of spiritual strength. For other people, the source of food. For yet others, the ocean is a source of transportation, of connection. The more that we can understand the different ways that different communities relate to the sea, and the more that we can see how those connections and relationships can inform policy, the more effective and equitable those measures are likely to be. And it's by bringing the ocean life to the desks of the international policy makers that can help to give the ocean a voice, give future generations a voice, and help to ensure that we truly have informed decision-making processes going on. Great, now let's move on with our panelists with a few more questions. Do you think changing terminology from small island developing states to big ocean states will help empower more islanders to take action? Definitely, I think it changes the whole way you, you look at things. Seychelles, our ocean territory, EZ, is three thousand times bigger than the islands. If we took that bigger approach, the effect that island states would have, ocean states, on climate and on biodiversity would be multiplied much, much more. We would make a much bigger difference by thinking along the lines. Our biggest problem is the resources and the work that Oliver and Necton mission is one of the things that is critical to the ocean discussion. It's, we don't know enough yet. We are planning the sustainable development of our economies without knowing the resources that we have. We know we have fish, and we know the fish that we do have is in trouble. We don't know what's out there. So how can island states or big ocean states really sustainably plan their future if you don't know what you have? And this is critical. When we talk about money, we're talking about money, throwing money at, at, at sea defenses. This is uh, uh, protecting coasts. It is important, yes. But what is, what's out there that we are not protecting because we don't know it's there? It's critical. Whenever you walk into a room as an individual or a part of a community, your identity is essential in how you create your, your vision for the future. And I think the, the, one of the biggest influences in creating that identity comes to culture. And culture is influenced by the arts. And so, Sophie, how have you utilized the arts to assist in helping the general public here in Seychelles understand climate science? People want to care. 
but they just don't see the connection it has with them. So I think where arts comes in is arts makes things simple, it brings emotion, and it brings creativity. So by combining these things with the scientific aspect, you have a balance, you, you strike a balance with it, and people start to feel the bridge. You bridge the gap with them so that, oh, they, they, they can have the emotion linked to it, and then they think, oh, maybe I should do some more research about it, and then they go and educate themselves further. So I think this is what's really critical in, in terms of connecting the arts to the science that we have today. Now, Oliver, how important is it for people to know about the deep ocean and their blue backyard? And how is Necton helping in this? And also, how do you think exploration and education can help with ocean rights and enable humans to live in harmony with nature and have reverence for the ocean? I think we need to do things differently when it comes to storytelling, you know, because if we want to make a difference, that's the way we need to do it. You know, what, we're not cutting through loudly enough at the moment, and we need to find new ways to do that. We did the deepest uh, live comedy show from Bermuda a few years ago, which helped people to engage in the ocean in a different way. And I think we've got to do that. Yes, science and education are critical parts of that. Within education, we need governments to step up particularly and make sure that the ocean is in the curriculum first and foremost, because often it actually isn't, which means that it's not taught. And so people use case studies which are in um, you know, terrestrial experiences or, or whatever, rather than the ocean, and they should be using the ocean. Very simple. It's just a lever that needs to be pulled in government, get it into the curriculum, then the... Um, um, then you find that the, uh, the exam board starts setting questions on the ocean. People start teaching it. Job done. You know, it, and that's where the lever is, we think, in that particular area. That you can start to have things at scale. What the governments are now doing to, uh, to create uh, and, and coordinate with other um, uh, governments in the region around what's called the Western Indian Ocean Resilience and Prosperity Initiative. Again, the Seychelles government has stepped forward and said, look, what's happening here is all well and good. We're doing our bit. But that's, that's not enough. We need to extend. We need to go further. We need to work collectively because the ocean is connected. As you said earlier, fish swim. Um, and so we need to ensure that the nations come together and create a holistic um, ocean, regional ocean policy and a framework that initiatives like the Great Blue Wall can come into and say, right, we now have a new uh, policy framework. We now have a new strategy and a framework. So we know what different policies and programs should go on. And it's that regional thinking that is the next step. And yet again, the government of Seychelles have led the way. They've got ten, all the countries of the Western Indian Ocean together, and they've unanimously agreed that we need a new Indian Ocean policy. The ownership of the solutions is here in, uh, in countries like Seychelles and, and the Western Indian Ocean. And that's what we're seeing from Seychelles. Seychelles taking great leadership on it. It's very important. Like, honestly, I, I've been working as senior policy analyst for five years now at the ministry, and we focus our policies on the people, right? And, but we're finding that we can't make good decisions when we don't have any data to back us up with the decisions that we're making. So any kind of scientific data that comes into the country, we are very grateful because this is what's informing our policies to make them better, to make them more robust, and also to create ownership within the scientific community and government so that we can work together to move the country forward. There's still too many what, what, uh, things going on in what's called parachute science, where scientists and the internationally arrive, they go there, they take the data, and then they, they exit. Um, it's like someone walking into your house, take, going into your fridge, opening the fridge, taking all the food out, and walking out, not even saying thank you on the way out. That happens a lot, and it still does. It's old-school colonial science, and it's very simple. The approaches which we take, working hand-in-hand -hand with the Seychelles and the Maldives next, is to co-define what that program looks like, decide the program, decide what the objectives are, then co-deliver it, and ensure that all the outcomes are owned and invested in the country of origin, that the data is owned, that the biological specimens are owned by that country. Um, and then the solutions will also be owned by that country because the research is being driven by the national priorities. It's not rocket science, it's just straightforward, but more of it needs to go on. So we hope that we'll be able to catalyze and encourage a lot more countries, a lot more international collaborating scientists to start acting in, in a far more ethical way, which will help underpin uh, far more equitable ocean rights. We know what our direction of travel. We know what we're doing. The scientists are telling us. There's a lot we don't know as well. 
That doesn't mean we shouldn't act, and we should be acting on the information that we have. Yes, our science policy needs to be far better. There needs to be far greater applied science. But we need to do something fundamentally different because it's not, it's not a lack of information which is, which is not affecting the decisions that need to be made because we all know what's happening, right? We're aware of what's happening, and yet the decisions are, stopped, uh, are not being made. So something different needs to occur there, and I think it may be linked into our values and into our beliefs. If you look at the world at the moment, 85% of the world subscribes to a belief system. So where are those heads of, of those belief systems standing up, mobilizing people through their networks to say, all right, look at what the scientists are saying, look at what the politicians are saying. What can we do as, a, as, as, as large faiths around the world? Because they can mobilize people in a profound way that can change values and beliefs. And that may be a, something which we could do. So not just connect science to policy, connect science to policy to belief systems, because perhaps there's something in there that we could do a lot more of. You can try and change someone's mind, but until you change their heart and what they're feeling about that situation or that idea, that's when the, the movements will happen, mm -hmm. for sure. The protection of the environment is enshrined in our constitution. It's in our human rights charter. Article 38 of the constitution guarantees every Seishoa the right to a safe environment. So when you start right from their meaning, in theory, any action that the government takes that harms the environment can be questioned in front of the Constitutional Court. It's not as easy as that, but it shows you how important we... You see, w without the environment, Seychelles is nothing. Our tourism is a marine-based, it's a nature-based, mainly nature-based tourism. Fisheries depends on the environment. Without a healthy environment, Seychelles ceases to exist. At least in Seychelles, we can say we have the political will from, from the top. It doesn't mean that because our, our leaders are on the same page, we, we've had, what, um, three successive presidents now all saying the same thing on the oceans. It does not necessarily mean that the people on the street, let alone others, are necessarily fully on board. Each time you have an interview on, in, in, in the media on the Seychelles spatial, uh, Marine Spatial Plan and interview fishermen, you can see they begin to have an understanding, but they have their complaints. Mm -hmm. So it's important that, yes, political will is important, especially in leading the cabinet, in, especially if you, if you control the parliament, your party controls the parliament in, in legislation. But for the Marine Spatial Plan, it was five years of consultation. Five years. And when it was enacted, you still had people say, I wasn't asked. And that's in a country of 90,000 people, 98,000 people. It's making sure that all the dots are connected. Absolutely. Beautifully said. Thank you all for being here today. Oliver, Sophie, Ambassador Jamal, please give our panelists a round of applause. Thank, Thank you all you so much. Thank you.